welcome to the podcast of the Project on Shiism and Global Affairs at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. My name is Mohamed Saga, and I'm an Associate and Research Director for Shia History and Identity at the Project, as well as a PhD candidate in Islamic History and Civilization at the University of Chicago. Today, we are joined by Professor Fred Donner, the Peter M. Ritzma Professor of Near Eastern History at the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. His career has significantly contributed to some of the very core issues at the origins of Islam, identity of Muslims and the role of the Quran and the history and thought of Islam in the late antique Near East. He also happens to be one of my advisors at the University of Chicago, and I'm delighted to host this conversation with him today. So first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Fred Donner for joining us today. Um, uh, Fred Donner, uh, just to give a little bit of a background um, of his uh, of his very uh, illustrious career, um, he attended Princeton University, where he received his PhD in Near Eastern Studies in 1975. Um, since then, however, he's taught, and what he's of course his career has uh, really been built around um, is Islamic and modern Middle Eastern history. Uh, and he taught at Yale University, um, and since 1982, he's been here at the University of Chicago, um, in both in the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations Department um, and the Oriental Institute, where he teaches courses on early and medieval Islamic history, Islamic law, and Arabic paleography and epigraphy. Uh, Donner's, uh, Professor Donner's early research focuses on relations between pastoral nomads and the settled society in the Near East, and over the years has shifted to Islamic historiography. Quranic studies, Arabic papyrology, and the origins of Islam, which hopefully we'll talk about several of these uh, later in the interview today. His major publications include The Early Islamic Conquests, which was published in 1981, Princeton University Press, Narratives of Islamic Origins, The Beginnings of Islamic Historical Writing, and Muhammad and the Believers at the Origins of Islam, uh, which was published by Harvard University Press in uh, 2010. He's also authored several dozen scholarly articles on early and medieval Islamic history, Chronic studies um, and, and many other um, volumes, uh, many other um, uh, topics as well. Um, recently, most recently, um, he edited a, a volume entitled Christians and the Others in the Umayyad State with uh, Antoine Boru in 2016. And he's currently co editing, although it might have been, uh, I don't know what state it's at now, with uh, a, a volume uh, to be called Scripts and Scriptures Writing and Religion in Arabia, circa 500 to 700 CE. Um, I'd like to really thank you, Professor Donner. Uh, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, and I want to, the first question that, I, that I'd like to pose to you is, uh, how were you introduced to Middle Eastern studies and Islamic studies? What got you interested and why have you remained committed to its study throughout time? Well, that's a long time ago, I can't, but I can remember how it happened, actually. I went to college intending to study chemistry, I thought. And in the course of my first two years in college, I discovered that I didn't enjoy lab chemistry as I had in high school, so I wasn't enjoying that aspect of chemistry. I was very engaged by physical chemistry, um, thinking about gas molecules bumping against each other and making pressure and so on. Uh, but I could never get the right answer on the problem sets. The math was just a little beyond my abilities at that point. Uh, so I thought, well, I can't do the kind of chemistry I like, and I don't like the kind of chemistry I can do, so maybe I shouldn't think about chemistry. So I thought about other options, and by chance, I took a course in my sophomore year at Princeton uh, on ancient art, a survey course in the fall semester on ancient art, because a friend of mine had come and said, hey, I'm going to take this course on ancient art. You want to take it? It sounds like it'd be fun. And we talked about it. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of nice. I'll learn about Greek sculpture and Roman art and so on. Um, well, this was really a course on ancient art. It started with cave painting, Lascaux and things like that, you know, 10,000 from 15,000 BCE. Yeah. Uh, and then it went to ancient Egypt. And we learned about Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom art. And then it went to ancient Mesopotamia, Sumerian art, and Akkadian and uh, through the Hittites and the Canaanites. And, you know, finally, uh, the last three or four weeks, we did Greek and Roman art. Uh, I was not, however, disappointed. Um, I got quite interested, actually, in, in reading sort of on the side to sort of understand the artwork. I started reading about ancient Mesopotamia. 
And uh, I got interested in that and reading some of this romantic early archaeology by people like Leonard Woolley digging up ziggurats in Iraq, you know. And uh, this was a very romantic kind of uh, calling, it seemed. And I really enjoyed reading about it. And I also thought to myself, hmm, you can't do chemistry. What do I want to do? What do, I, do I want to work in a chem lab somewhere when I get my degree? No. I want to, what do I want to do with my life? I want to travel. And I'd really like to learn a foreign language well. I had enjoyed Latin and French in high school. And I thought, well, if I, if I go into Mesopotamian archaeology, uh, I'll have to travel and I'll have to learn languages because it's all about you know, learning Sumerian and Akkadian and so on. So I explored courses at Princeton. I started taking courses on the Near East uh, and ended up entering the Department of Near Eastern Studies. I, th I thought I was going to be um, doing ancient Near East at first. Uh, but I decided, as they said, I wanted to take Akkadian, but they said, you can't take that as your first Semitic language because it has a totally insane writing system, you know, with these cuneiform uh, signs. It isn't even an alphabet, it's a syllabary, it's a very complicated transcription system. And they said, so take some other Middle Eastern language that's a little bit more tractable. Well, I thought mm, the two obvious candidates would be Hebrew, which is an ancient language, or Arabic, which is used in the Near East. And I thought, well, maybe I'll take the Arabic. So I started with Arabic. And then from then on, I got pulled gradually into Arabic studies and more into sort of Islamic history. We, in that department, we were required as majors in the department to take the full span of Near Eastern history from the Neolithic mm -hmm. to the present, basically, over yeah. two years, uh, two full years of history. And I sort of then had an exposure to uh, medieval Islamic history and late medieval and Ottoman history yeah. and so on. Yeah. And I also took other courses in art. I took a course on medieval art, half of which it turns out was on Byzantine art. It was mm. taught by a famous Byzantine art historian at Princeton, Kurt Weizmann, one of the greats of Byzantine art history. He happened to be teaching the class. I had never even heard or thought about Byzantine art, but I fell in love with it. And of course, it also deals mostly with the Near East, or a lot of it, is, it deals with places like right. what they, Turkey and Syria and so on. So all of that together kind of gave me another um, dose of information about the Near East. So I was enjoyed very much learning about the Near East and ended up after my undergraduate training thinking, well, I want to go on and study uh, Near Eastern history, particularly by that time, I'd focused more on the medieval Islamic period. And I'd had a year of Arabic study in Lebanon, as you mentioned. Right. So Arabic was was um, fairly functional by that point. So that opened the way to the doors to the source material for studying medieval Islamic history. So it's quite, um, that's, that's interesting to hear because it's been, uh, I think now there are fewer programs probably across uh, the United States um, that, folk, that you know require um, undergraduates or maybe even graduate students to take that. Uh, sequence or uh, to learn about the depth of Islamic history or or even the Near East, ancient Near East and so on. Um, so from what it, it sounds like that was quite formative and giving you a background to then explore your own interests. Um, could you talk a little bit more about um, the, the, the sort of educational philosophy behind that um, and maybe a little bit about your own uh, professors at Princeton who, who uh, had an impact on your on your trajectory, early trajectory? Um, sure. Well, I mean, there were a number of faculty members there that I worked with. <clears throat> First, there was a whole group of people who taught language, uh, from whom I took Arabic mainly. Uh, when I came back as a graduate student, I also took Syriac uh, mm -hmm. with some of them. Uh, I guess the main one was my the man who became my mentor, really, there, John Marks, who was mm -hmm. himself actually trained as a theologian, not a historian, but he ended up being the person in that department who was responsible for teaching the history of the ancient Near East. Mm. Uh, and so I took with him his one semester survey on the sort of early ancient Near East from the Neolithic up to about 300 BC and then or the fall, you know, late Persian Empire period. And then um, his second semester course, which I loved, was a course called the Near East from Alexander to Muhammad which was wonderful. I mean, it was all about the Hellenistic Near East. Started with a, um, an overview of the career of Alexander the Great, which if you're not, anybody's not familiar with it, go out and read about it, it's just mind blowing. And 
was for people at the time and subsequently. I mean, Alexander became such a kind yeah. of grow up figure for centuries. Um, it's still a name we use. My son actually is named Alexander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but anyway, that you know opened up the whole the Near East in the centuries before the rise of Islam. Of course, then this is the period when Judaism kind of crystallizes. Christianity emerges out of Judaism in this period. Um, uh, it's you know then the Romans take over the Near East and yeah. So it, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of of interesting stuff. The early church is all in the Near East and then. Mm -hmm early development of Christianity. And then of course, at the very end, Islam appears out of this matrix kind of. So it's a, that's a fascinating period of history. And actually my, um, I think a lot of people think of me as an Islamic historian, but I've, I've chosen to take my title at the University of Chicago as um, a professor of Near Eastern history. Yeah. I'm, very, yeah. I'm very much focused on the idea of history as a discipline and being a historian and not accepting this hard and fast division between the ancient Near East and the Islamic Near East. This is an artifact of uh, the Islamic tradition itself, actually, the division mm -hmm. of Jahiliyyah and Islam. Well, for historians, we're not believers in that necessarily. So we, uh, it's important, I think, to see across the divide, to see the continuities, because there are powerful continuities from, say, 500 to 800. Uh, yeah. You know, things don't just suddenly change overnight with the rise of Islam. I mean, the, the first Muslims are a tiny, tiny minority of people. Yeah. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of continuity. Yeah, absolutely. So that actually um, it takes us to, to um, the, well, actually maybe before uh, going uh, into the origins, uh, the question of the origins of Islam. Um, I, I did want to ask you a little bit about um, how you believe or how you've seen the field of Islamic uh, history, uh, especially you know, early or late antique, early Islamic history, uh, changed since you entered uh, your own studies, entered the field. Um, has it been uh, for the better? Has it changed for the better, for the worse? Where have we fallen short? Where have we done really good? Um, well, it certainly has changed. I think it's changed for the better. One thing that's happened is that this uh, this vision of of seeing early Islam. Uh, as part of the late antique world is something now that's commonplace, that's accepted by everyone. Right. Um, when I started my studies, it was not the case. Uh, but it really began with the work of Peter Brown, famous historian, uh, who wrote this wonderful book that appeared when I was a graduate student called The World of Late Antiquity, uh, which really, uh, it studied, it sort of created the whole field of late antiquity studies. I mean, if you look at the titles of books, Mm -hmm. Before the publication of that book, there are hardly any that use the word late, the phrase late antiquity in the title. Mm -hmm. Hardly any. Nobody was talking about late antiquity. There were people who did later Roman history or Byzantine history. There were people who did Eastern church history. Um, there were people, a few, who did like Sasanian history in Iran uh, before the rise of Islam. And then there were people who did early Islamic history. Peter Brown's book, The World of Late Antiquity, really kind of pulled together four separate fields of people who had not been talking to other. The people who had done Eastern church history were the only people in those days who read, for example, Syriac texts. The very few people who learned Syriac in those days were those people who did Eastern church history, which was kind of a stuffy, musty field that was pursued by monks and a few priests and hardly anybody else thought about it. The people who did Byzantine history didn't think much about that material. Uh, and the people who did Islamic history certainly didn't think about it and so on. But, but uh, Peter Brown's book fused all of us together. He basically said to all of us, look, you're all working on the same geographical area at the same period. You're just using different source languages. You need to talk to each other. Right. And he brought us all together and integrated and made this much richer picture of mm -hmm. the way society developed and the historical evolution of these societies. So that was a, a huge breakthrough, really, in the way scholarship was pursued on the history of the Near East in this era. Uh, and that happened just as I was in graduate school. It began at that time. It took, of course, decades for the uh, impact of that to be felt. Now we see it fully. Uh, yeah. There are more and more positions that are advertised as positions in late antiquity studies and you want somebody who can also do early islamic material but also works with say syriac or coptic right. uh, it is you know but when i was a graduate student 
I went to grad school and they, I, they said, well, what do you want to study? I said, I want to do you know, early Islamic history. They said, well, you do Arabic and then you do Persian. No one even mentioned Greek or Syriac. I right. took Greek and Syriac because I was already kind of keyed into this, but it was not what people normally had done up until that time. So that's a huge change, I think, in the nature of the field or fields. Um, there, and I think it's a, a change definitely for the better because I think we have a much more nuanced sense of how history proceeded. And it was kind of this black and white notion before that you have, you have uh, the period before the rise of Islam and then suddenly Islam comes and everything is different. And of course, it's not that way at all. Exactly. So, um, so that it raises interesting questions about um, the very nature of the question or the assumptions behind the idea of origins of Islam or the vocabulary that we can even use um, when describing, um, you know, the uh, the prophet, the time of the Prophet Muhammad and afterwards. And so, um, could you? Uh, it would be interesting to hear about your own um, research in this field. Um, and you, you alluded to some of this um, in, in your remarks, but what was, so the way that scholars had talked about the origins of Islam or a Muslim identity, um, how was that spoken about? Um, and how, why did you find it necessary to then uh, undertake your line of research, um, which really, um, you know, question this uh, idea of a set or reified Muslim identity and then signaled um, readers and, 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 and scholars this idea of the monotheistic reform movement. Um, and if you could uh, speak a little bit about that, that would be very useful. Well, there are a lot of questions in your question, actually. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of different aspects to it. And it certainly is something, these things are thing came to me slowly over, over many years. Um, you know, when I was starting out in the late 60s and the 70s, there were hardly any scholars, uh, young scholars, who were going into the period of early Islamic history. It was sort of considered uh, known. You know, we have the Quran. We know Muhammad brought the Quran. Uh, that's it, you know. And Wellhausen uh, said it all already <laughs> back in the 19th century. Um, the the real interest in the 70, 60s and early 70s, the real excitement in the field of Middle Eastern studies was in Ottoman history because mm -hmm. uh, the Ottomanists, Bernard Lewis and others, had discovered the Ottoman archives and started to utilize the Ottoman archives. And it was realized by scholars there's this treasure trove of documentary evidence for the 500 years of Ottoman history. Um, and so this was very attractive to many students who wanted to do Middle Eastern history. They got drawn into this because it had a, a wealth of, of material and you could say things about history that was almost impossible for any other period. So that's where the real excitement was. Early Islam was kind of, I was a weirdo to go into early Islamic history uh, because, uh, you know, it was just seen as, well, you're just going to be um, adding footnotes to what other people have already written. Sure. Um, you know, the, as I said, the, the idea was, well, we, we know what the prophet's life was like. Uh, you know, Montgomery Watt had already published his Muhammad at Mecca and Muhammad in Medina books, and they were kind of the standard works. Uh, they're still standard works, but I mean, that was considered to be like, mm, that's it. Uh, that material has all basically been done. It was a very kind of, shall we say, positivistic approach to the sources for that period of history. Uh, using the Arabic sources of, say, the ninth century uh, to talk about what was going on in the seventh century. But that was, was normal. That, but these were considered primary sources. They're not, of course, they're secondary sources, but we considered them to be primary sources. Um, mm -hmm. The Quran was something that very few people worked on in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, these these were, uh, it was a very kind of traditional kind of field. So there weren't so many people going into it. That changed really um, with the, it was partly the impact, I think, of Peter Brown's work and the effect it had on other scholars, but it really changed with the uh, publication of uh, a few crucial pieces of work. I was by purely blind luck. Uh, when I got out of the army in Germany in 1970, I stayed in Germany for one year to study uh, at the university near where I had been stationed, the University of Erlangen in northern Bavaria. And by 
purely by happenstance. Um, there was a man there, Gunter Luling, who was just finishing his dissertation at the time on the Quran, and he had revolutionary ideas about the Quran. Well, he offered a course on readings in the Quran. I thought, I'll take this. So I took a whole year of study with him. I was one of the very few students he had. And the thing about him, he, he came up with all kinds of uh, hypotheses, many of which have not proven uh, panned out exactly, but his approach, he was very intelligent and very knowledgeable. And he, what, he, what he did basically was open my eyes to the fact that the Quran is not, shall we say, an open book. It's mm. not obvious that there's all kinds of questions about what the text means, about how the text came to be. All of this was something that he made me aware of, which actually a lot of other scholars, I think, were not clued into either. And then at about the same time, there was work being done by Albrecht Nolte in Germany on the historiography of the sources for the early Islamic period, which kind of blew the lid off that, made it clear that, well, we can't just quote Tabari from the ninth century and assume that it's, that it's uh, accurate factual information. It's been, been manipulated and shaped and you know, spun by various transmitters. And we have to ask, you know, how is this material in what, what way is it? Uh, much easier, but yeah, as you mentioned, it's not that. <laughs> that was another uh, important insight. And then building on all that kind of work was the work of um, both uh, John Wansbro, who uh, proposed a revolutionary view of the Quran that it only crystallized much later than the seventh century. And then his student, uh, Patricia Crona and Michael Cook wrote their book, Hagarism, which really kind of uh, me, was the pub, the entry into the public mind of all of this uh, ferment um, with its uh, revolutionary hypotheses. Again, some of those reconstructions have proven to be uh, not tenable, but they, as Albert Harani once put it in his uh, pithy way, he said, well, I don't think they're getting the right answers, but they're asking the right questions. I mean, he, in other words, saw that what they were trying to do was to approach the origins of Islam as historians must approach it. That is yeah. with a critical, a critical uh, stance towards all of the source material and to sort of test the source material for reliability and see what do we think we can actually say. That really opened up the field in a tremendous way starting in the late 1970s. And ever since then, it's been, uh, a growth field, you might say, early Islamic history, because there are all these interesting questions now that people didn't see in the 1960s. Uh, by 1980, there were all kinds of people being drawn into this field because there were there were really live, important questions to be addressed that hadn't been resolved. So many still haven't been resolved. But it attracts people to have unresolved problems you want to work on. Exactly. And um, the early Islamic period or the late antique period is full of uh, such questions. And there's seems to be an endless way of, you know, looking at uh, the, the era as a jigsaw and kind of looking at different ways that are different sources that can be used to solve questions such as, um, you know, dating of the Quran, for example, or the context of the language of the Quran. Uh, and so you've worked on uh, some of those issues uh, yourself as well. And um, I'd like to get to that a little bit later. Um, but um, I want to ask you specifically uh, about the, um, the uh, one of your uh, major interventions in the field, which has been the thesis of the monotheistic reform movement, uh, or that the uh, the identity, I should say, of uh, the or the nature of Prophet Muhammad's movement, as you call it in your book, Muhammad and the Believers. Um, and uh, I was uh, wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, why you found um, the question of Muslim identity uh, in the early period, or if we can call it Muslim identity, um, an interesting one, um, and what you hope to contribute to the field uh, with, uh, with uh, your uh, work on that subject. Well, you know, that was not a question that I came up with sort of on my own right away. Um, it's a, the story of it is, is one of these object lessons in why sometimes it's good to do something that somebody else wants you to do. Uh, in this case, um, I was invited in the early 90s, I guess, um, by a colleague in London, Lawrence Conrad, uh, to participate in a workshop. He had organized, he and several other colleagues had organized a series of workshops that he called Late Antiquity and Early Islam Workshops to sort of try and work with all, and get all these people together from these different fields 
and have us all address particular issues. And they conceived of one of the workshops to be on um, concepts of communal identity in the late antique and early Islamic world. Okay, among different communities of people, Nestorian Christians, as we used to say, Church of the East, or Jacobites, or you know, the Jewish communities of the near, whatever. And so he wrote to me, in those days there was no email yet, he wrote to me and said, would I prepare a paper for this conference on the concept of community in the earliest Muslim community? And I said, all right, I'll do that. That sounds interesting. And I wanted to go to this conference in London anyway, so it sounded good. It should be an easy question, yeah. So, thought, yeah. so, so I then said, well, what have I gotten myself into? I, had this, I sat down, I said, uh, what does this mean? Concept, you know, how did these people think of themselves? By that time, I was well along in the writing of my book, uh, Narratives of Islamic Origins, on the historiographical tradition, which I'd been working on for almost 20 years. And I was quite convinced that a lot of the, uh, what we usually call the Syria literature or the Hadith literature, uh, all this, uh, literary sources for the early Islamic period were for the most part later in the formulation which we have them now. It doesn't mean that there isn't early material in there, but the problem is you can't tell what's early and what's not. And so for a historian to draw on that material is very perilous because you're likely to be basing your deductions on something that actually isn't early at all. It's much later. Uh, and we can't tell the difference still for the most part, or we have a hard time. So I decided, well, in order to address this question of communal identity in the earliest Muslim community, the only thing I can do is to, is to look first at the Quran, because I, I was convinced that the Quran text was very early. Uh, that's also something I go into in my narratives book and try to demonstrate that I, why I think the Quran text is early. And then I thought, okay, so I'll look, I'll read through the Quran sort of specifically with an eye to what are the notions of community in the, in the Quran text? Who is it addressed to and how is it you know, presented as a community and so on? Well, I started doing this and after a short time, I guess we can say, I began to realize actually this book hardly ever talks about Muslims. Mm. It's always talking about mu'minun, about believers. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, or, you know, over and over a thousand times. It, it, that is clearly the operative notion of the identity uh, formulation, you might say, for the earliest community was as mu'minin, as believers. Um, and so I then had to ask, okay, well, what does the Quran say about who the believers are? Can we get a closer definition of them? And, you know, there are passages where it says those who believe, those who um, believe in God and the last day and do the prayers, do good works and so on. So you start to get a kind of short list of characteristics of who the believers are. So this is fine. Uh, but then I noticed there are a couple of passages in the Quran, as any Muslim will know, that, that talk about how um, some of the peoples of the book um, are among the believers. And they have nothing to fear, meaning in the afterlife, they're going to be judged positively by God. Um, well, this then created an interesting um, problem, you might say, for me, because I had always, up until that time, always thought, well, there's, there's Muslims, and then there's these other people, and the Muslims were clearly separate. But when, when I realized, well, actually, they're not talking about Muslims, they're talking about believers, and the believers might include some Christians or Jews. It says in the book that it might include Christians or Jews. And then I remembered, well, there's also this, this uh, quasi-document that we have, the so-called Sahifa, or the Constitution of Medina, as it's sometimes called, um, the Prophet's agreement with the people of Yathrib, which includes the Jews in the community in some way. Um, that also seemed to go. So, so that's where this idea began, the idea of a believer's movement. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to call it at first, but I, I remembered reading some years earlier about some writings about the very beginnings of Christianity, and somebody had written about, he didn't want to talk about Christianity or Christians in like the first 75 years after the death of Jesus. 
but there, one scholar referred to what he called the Jesus movement. Mm. I thought, hmm, well, we could call this the believers movement because mm. it's a kind of movement, a kind of identity group. Yeah. Um, this is defined by this notion of being a believer. That leaves a lot still to be clarified exactly where the line's drawn and so on. But um, that's, that's where my right. notion of believers it came straight out of the Quran, you might say. Yeah. Uh, and so as I say, it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a good lesson to remember that if somebody yeah. jawbones you and tries to twist your arm into reading a paper at a conference, maybe you should do you it. Should it. it yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, that's um, it's a very interesting point. And I think, you know, it also touches upon some of the, um, you know, doctrinal or um, beliefs that are mentioned even in the Quran itself about the sort of notion of, maybe for lack of a better term, uh, charisma or the wadaya um, of the Prophet Muhammad. So his his role or, or other prophets like throughout history um, that have a sense of loyalty and leadership, um, but we don't necessarily see early um, set institutions or scholarly classes or things along these lines, which, which, which we tend to then identify with more stricter social boundaries, which can emerge uh, uh, throughout time. Um, so when we're thinking about this notion of, um, of, the, of, Prof, uh, of the believers movement or of you know, the movement of Prophet Muhammad, um, I think that that can help us in sort of um, becoming more um, specific about what exactly we mean um, by what uh, either Mormonian or Muslim, you know, however they call themselves, um, what they actually may have believed or how they may have practiced um, their beliefs. Um, and so it also raises questions about the, the idea of, you know, what's the difference between, or why do we see a, a religious, move, what, what we call a religious movement then emerge, rather than what maybe others might have called a sectarian movement, you know, and that's, that's a question that's been poses, uh, you know, why couldn't this have just become, for example, a Christian, another Christian, you know, uh, sect, for example, or another monotheistic sect in that sense, um, for pre-existing religion. So, um, you know, have you, have you thought about this question of, you know, how can we define, um, you know, how does a new sect or a new religion develop over time? And how can we draw the boundaries, generally speaking, between a sect and a religion? And, and what does that kind of look like in the early uh, in the period that you're that you're examining? It's a little, you know, the, the difference between a sect and a religion is a little bit like the difference between a dialect and a language. You know, it's partly a question of uh, where power and or authority um, becomes established and how it defines itself. Somebody once said, you know, a language is a dialect with an army. <laughs> mm. And one could say something like that maybe with sectarianism, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at a religion like with a language, I mean, there's usually a spectrum of beliefs. And the question is, uh, where do we consider the big tent? And then yeah. what are the sort of divisions within the big tent, which we might see as sects. But um, so in the case of the believers movement, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's still very unclear to me uh, because this procedure happens in the seventh century for which our sources, our documentary sources are really horribly bad, not sufficient. Um, it's still not clear to me how the transition from a believers movement that was more, shall we, inclusive of people who had other established identities as say Christians or Jews. Apparently some of them could be part of the believers movement. And at a certain point they get to find out or they yeah. find themselves out. And that process is still very unclear. Mm -hmm. It seems to me from the documentary evidence we have, which is limited, that this process uh, is well underway by 700. So much of the 600s of seventh century may be a period where there's this kind of fluidity of communal boundaries or communal identities, people moving back and forth. And we know from other cases that are better documented, that people do this all the time anyway. They may claim to be a Presbyterian, but then they may go to the Lutheran church, or they may claim to be a Catholic, but they go to the a Protestant church for whatever practical reasons, and they may come back to Catholic. I mean, you know, this is normal in human societies. Actually, uh, Professor Jack Tanus from Princeton recently published a massive book called The Making of the Medieval Middle East, which is really all about this point, about fluidity 
uh, mm -hmm. really, between religious communities, between different Christian sects, but also I think when the believers movement appears in the Near East, as I said at the beginning, it's a very small number of people. It's a, another player on the board, you might say. And I think people move back and forth into and out of the believers movement and these other groups. Uh, and then at some point, and in a way we don't really understand how clearly a, a harder and faster division is drawn between these believers um, with their focus on the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, as opposed to other groups who don't want to privilege the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. And we start to see them as a different group and we start calling them Muslims. And they start calling themselves Muslims, I think, more at that point. The word Muslim, of course, occurs in the Quran, but it doesn't mean what we mean by Muslim for the most part. Right. And someone right. dedicated to dedicated to God in some way. Right. Right. Um, you know, when it says Abraham is Hanif and Musliman, it's not they're not saying he's a Muslim in the modern sense of the word or the medieval sense of the word. They're saying he's a Hanif who is completely dedicated to God. That's what Muslim right. means. Right. And then, yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but there, there also is that there, you can look at that um, more esoteric meaning or, or at least doctrinal meaning in the Quran, one interpretation of Muslim, of course, referring, as you mentioned, to prophets before. So that, you know, eternal monotheistic pure message, right, that, um, you know, many Muslims even today, you know, will call other Muslims, uh, other, uh, prophets, Moses, Jesus, and so on, Muslims, right? Um, but a lot of times that second level question doesn't then emerge as to, okay, so then what does that mean in regards to contemporary Muslim identity today? Um, so, um, the, uh, so in, in, these, in these debates too, um, and we've alluded to this, uh, the Quran is actually, is quite central um, to a lot of these questions. Um, and, you know, uh, one of those reasons, of course, being the fact that, um, there seems to be a, a large amount of evidence uh, that it really is an early text. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, how, um, how the Quran, how um, you know, methodologies towards approaching the Quran in, that can in, impact how we view the socio-political history um, of, uh, the, um, of the uh, uh, early Islamic period. And it seems to be that, you know, so for many, uh, scholars, whether they date the crystallization of the Quran over a longer period of time, allows space for then reconceptualizations of, um, you know, the early Muslim community. Whether that's, uh, you know, theories um, that you know some of the revisionists have uh, have placed in terms of, you know, the early Muslim community really being, you know, a Christian sect, for example, or a Judeo Arab movement, as you know, some some of the works have have, um, have uh, discussed. So. Um, if you could speak a little bit about the questions about, you know, the dating, crystallization, and language of the Quran, and then how that in turn is related to the question of identity. Well, it's a really complicated ball of wax. Um, a lot of um, uh, difficult issues dealing with the Quran, aside from the fact that it's a sacred text, which makes it mm, something very touchy to deal with in any way. But... Um, you know, th there's the language component of the Quran, which is something we're still, I think, to be honest, serious scholars are still trying to sort out the linguistic facts of the Quran. Um, I know that there's a, a sense that, well, the 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran is the Quran, just as it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. But the problem is that the earliest manuscripts we have of the Quran, which go back probably some of them to the seventh century, uh, certainly to the early eighth century, um, are written in an extremely, uh, what would be called defective writing system. Uh, first of all, as most people who know Arabic realize, uh, it only renders the consonants, uh, none of the short vowels and often Many of the long vowels are not there either, um, especially the long A. It was a, has a long checkered history of how you write the long A in these languages. Um, and so you have this consonantal script. The way you read the text is up in the air. There's ma often many ways to read a, a certain cluster of letter forms. Uh, we are still figuring out, it seems, um, exactly what these letter forms are. You know, some years ago, I thought, well, at least we know that. We can see what the rasam is. 
this is a Tao and this is a thought and so on. But no, it turns out that actually even some of the consonants, mm. we have misunderstood the letters. There's a recent article mm. actually about to appear um, by Ahmed al-Jalad, where he, shall we say, discovers uh, a new grapheme, a new letter in some of these early manuscripts that you know, suggests that we were misreading uh, and people have been mis misreading for centuries um, some of the text because they didn't understand the way it was actually written in the first instance. So there's all kinds of complicated problems. Like that. Then that's just sorting out the letters. Then once you start to try and string the letters together into words, you have the question of the, the voweling. Um, there's this doctrine in the Quranic tradition of the so-called canonical variant readings, seven or maybe 10 of them and two different recensions of each. So you've got like 15 or 20 different ways to read the text. Mm -hmm. um, differences are minor differences, but nonetheless, it suggests a lot of uncertainty over exactly how the text is to be read. The Arabic language of the Quran is not what we would call classical Arabic. Classical Arabic is a, a kind of artificial uh, literary idiom that emerges in the eighth and ninth century. Um, and the Quran, represents a somewhat different kind of Arabic. It's not classical Arabic. Um, whether it's related to the, what used to be talked about as the pre-Islamic uh, poetic koine, a kind of common language among the poets, or whether it's just Hijazi dialect or what it is exactly, we don't know. Um, we're still, people are still trying to sort this, you know, linguists who work with the Quran text, there are a few who do, uh, are still trying to uh, sort this all out. So the text is incredibly complicated. And you know that there's also this phenomenon you asked about the question of, of identity. Right. Um, there's also this question of um, what, what is the identity, you know, an Arab identity. Right. Of course, today we all understand what an Arab is, right? We have this modern, uh, ethnic nationalist conception of Arabness as we have of Germanness or Frenchness or anything else, a very modern conception from the 18th, 19th century and 20th century. And we just tend to blithely project that back to the seventh century and assume that all those people um, whom today in, in that area, we say they're all Arabs. So they must've all been Arabs then and they thought of themselves as Arabs, but there's very little evidence that they thought of themselves as Arabs. Um, there's, there's almost no texts, first of all, there are almost no texts at all of any kind from that right. period. But the few that we have don't talk about Arab identity, they talk about tribal identity. They thought of themselves as Tamimis or Paisis or uh, right. or something, and they fought each other, were rivals to each other. There, a, a broader uh, identity with these people you hated uh, was not something that was necessarily uh, there. Um, the Quran calls itself Quran and Arabian, mm -hmm. which is always translated as uh, a uh, an Arabic recitation, but I have a feeling it may mean something else. It may simply mean a clear recitation, that is a recitation that's not in some weird foreign language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Araba, the one, yeah. Araba, yeah. Araba to express an Arab. We talk about the vowel markings are called Arab. They're called the Arab, not because it makes it Arabic. It's called the Arab because it makes it clear. It right. Makes it clear, clear. A little bit ironic since the voweling isn't, isn't necessarily right. there in the early period, but yeah. So this whole question of the language of the Quran is also connected to the question of identity in some level. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Webb, uh, now at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, uh, has written a very nice book called what, Imagining the Arabs, which yeah. talks about this issue of an Arab identity in antiquity or the medieval period and argues that really an Arab identity emerges um, out of the late Umayyad period and into the Abbasid period. Um, when you have this group of people who are speaking a language, some kind of Arabic, uh, and they're ruling the empire, it becomes the official, um, I call it imperial Arabic, it's a uh, form of Hijazi Arabic. Um, that becomes the official language of the state and so on. And this, this fact of imperial control and ruling over vast populations of people who don't speak this language starts to lead to the coalescence of a notion of themselves as Arabs, as some kind of Arab identity. That's when you start to see it. So we don't want to see the movement as something that starts with an Arab identity, but rather the identity as something that comes out of the movement that expands.
So what's the uh, so then how would you define the relationship between Arab and Muslim? That these terms um, in terms of identity. Arab and Muslim. Yeah, Arab and Muslim. So are they covalent? Um, are they as in are they? Um, do you, yeah. see them? you know, of course, even today we know there are there are Arab Christians, right? Yeah. Um, quite a few yeah, of course. Of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, and in those days, in the, say the eighth century, as some kind of Arab identity began to be articulated in literary works and so on, uh, the majority of people who spoke Arabic probably were still Christians. Right. right. At least those people who were in places like, let us say, Yemen or Syria, Palestine, uh, Mesopotamia, they were there were many Arabic speaking peoples there before the rise of Islam, and many of them were Christians. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of Arabic speaking peoples in those countries were still in those areas were still yeah. Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether this early formulation of an Arab identity was something that was also linked to the empire and to uh, Islam, then uh, is a good question. I really can't answer it. Exactly. But it raises, I mean, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions because it, it also intersects with two of your, you know, the, two of the main areas which you've worked on, which is, of course, you know, the idea of Muslim identity or early Islam, but also the Islamic conquest. So it raises a lot of interesting questions of, okay, so, what, you know, were these, the, uh, were these Arab conquests, were they Muslim conquests, were they impacted by Islamic ideology, for lack of a better term? So, um, so, what, what, so what were the, how, how would you look at this identity, this question of identity and the conquest in turn, because um, it seems to be quite consequential. Yeah, I agree, but I, I'm not sure how to answer it. I, you know, I wrote an article that came out, what, two years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, where I basically I argue that, you know, as scholars, we have we have traditionally talked about either the Arab conquest or the Islamic conquest. My yeah. book was the early Islamic conquest. There are lots of books on the Arab conquest, including a recent one by uh, Robert Hoyland that talks about the Arab conquest. But in this article, I argued that really we shouldn't call it either because there was no Arab identity yet. Uh, we can't see Arabness as what's driving the movement, which is what an Arab conquest would imply, and what some earlier writers explicitly said um, that somehow this expansion was an expression of the national will of the Arab people. Well, no, we can't say that. There was no sense of an Arab people yet. But can we call it an Islamic conquest? Well, that's kind of hard too, because it, you know, Islam, as we understand it, doesn't really emerge until probably the early 8th century. Uh, there are components of it certainly there. The Quran, I think, is there. Uh, yeah belief in one God in the last day and so on. But of course, that's belief in one God in the last day has been around for centuries before the rise of Islam. So the formulation of Islam as a clear-cut religious faith or confession that's distinct from other religions was something that probably wasn't there at the time of the conquest. Yeah. Um, what we may have had was some kind of monotheistic revival movement that was preaching a stricter form of monotheism. Whether you can call that a religion yet, yeah. you know, or Islam yet is another question. So yeah. I argued in Saudi, we shouldn't call it the Islamic conquest, we shouldn't call it the Arab conquest. What are we gonna call it? I open mm -hmm. throw the question yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, we might call it the Quraysh conquest since mm -hmm. the Quraysh were driving it, or the Hijazi right. conquest. Right, the, right. But, you know, right. I don't well, think we're gonna yeah. get rid of these terms, Islamic conquest and Arab conquest, but we need to use them uh, yeah. more more aware yeah. of their limitations right right but it, i mean it does you know as you mentioned there is something there right so there is some kind of movement there is some kind of organizing i think so um, yeah so the question so it becomes very difficult as you mentioned and that's where the hard scholarly work will come um in terms of how to define or how to how to view that because there, you know it's you know you have these phenomena such as um you know the city you know the amsar or like the uh, you know the uh, i guess uh, i don't know what the english um standard as we use for like uh, conquest cities or forward bases or whatever. Um, garrison. garrison towns, right, right. Uh, so garrison towns and things like, so we have these things that are, you know, institutionally they have to reproduce. So there's, the, the, there has to be something that's um, driving that. Um, um, and there has to be some kind of semi-consistent policy making from, from the leadership, right? Um, so there's, there are, there are certain things that there's something there um, and it becomes very difficult to then um, I guess that's that's the next step, really, in the in the research to try to more precisely um, open up how we can think about these. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the thing is, when you ask, let us assume that there's some kind of expansion movement that results in the 
political takeover of a vast area of the Near East, which seems to be uh, undeniable. It seems that something like this happened. The yeah. question then is what's driving the movement? Well, I don't think it can be either, I don't think it can be uh, some kind of ethnic or national movement because there's no evidence for that in the earliest sources we have. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we should call it the Islamic conquest because I don't think Islam as we see it today, as we understand it was really quite there yet. A lot of the components yeah. were there, but it was a kind of inchoate monotheistic movement yet. Yeah. That there was some kind of religious impetus, I don't think we can doubt, and why? Because the earliest documents we have, the very first documents we have, where this new movement shows up in historical documentation are some of the early coins that were issued by the early caliphs using Sasanian coin dies or Byzantine coin dies. So they, they stamp new coinage, um, just like the Sasanian coins that had preceded them because they took over the mints and the dies. They use the same dies and they make yeah. Replicate, shall we say of those coins? But they add something, and what do they add in the margin? They add Bismillah in Arabic. Mm -hmm. This is a religious slogan. Yeah, uh, you yeah. may not think that they were all such great monotheists, so that they were also religious. But nonetheless, this seems to have been the kind of label or tagline, yeah. with, you know, the branding uh, item that they used to identify themselves as different from the previous regimes. Yeah, you know, yeah. we find this this resort to a kind of religious terminology emphasizing um, God uh, yeah. in the earliest coinage of what we usually call the believers movement or the, or the Muslim, the early Muslim state. Yeah. And it's interesting because when you look, for example, at Byzantine coinage, Roman and Byzantine coinage, um, there are a lot of Byzantine coins from the pre the century or two before Islam that show pictures of of Jesus uh, or something like that, but they never mention God. The mm -hmm. coins never mention God until like sometime, uh, just a few years before the rise of Islam. Oh wow. There's mm -hmm. an issue, a Byzantine coin issued in North Africa. So the, the uh, legends are in Latin, not in Greek. Mm -hmm. And it says, Deus adiuta Romanus, the, God helps the Romans. Mm -hmm. That's the first time in a Roman coin we see the word God. On mm -hmm. a and mm -hmm. then like within a few years, we see all these, as we would say, Muslim coins with, with Allah, the name of Bismillah or La ilaha illallah wahtahu la sharika lahu, things like this. There's no God mm -hmm. but God alone. He has no associate. These very strictly monotheistic uh, yeah. phrases begin to, uh, they occur on the coin. So I think we yeah. have to say that this movement had some kind of religious impetus. It doesn't mean that everybody that joined the movement was uh, a very pious person. Of course not. People join, especially military movements for all kinds of reasons. They want plunder, yeah. they, they want to have a good time, right. whatever, it's exciting. Right. Right. But nonetheless, what seems to have been legitimating the movement in the eyes of the, in the ears and minds of the people who were organizing it was this notion of uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and yeah, I, I remember you mentioned some of your other work that, um, you know, you have this wide array of tribes, you know, extremely diverse, um, because, you know, the, it's based on, you know, different, you know, logics of family lineage and so on in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, to be able to manage something along the lines of what actually happened in terms of the conquest, you know, without something like a religious organizing, you know, ideology or principle, um, would be, you know, would be extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, it requires a charismatic figure usually in the early period to be able to unite those tribes or at least to be able to reorganize those tribes in a way that, um, you know, the endemic sort of conflicts which plague them don't reappear. Um, and that's something that you see maybe even, uh, you know, in, in the seerah of the prophet and the biography of the prophet, you know, calling the prophet kind of as an arbiter. Um, between the, you know, the Aus and the Khazraj, for example. So you see sort of like, you know, uh, signals for, for this kind of pattern, um, even in the classical literature, um, that, you know, that, that, you know, that signal uh, to, to the phenomenon that you're discussing. And so I guess, so the, the, the follow-up question uh, that I had to that was that, um, you know, I think, so your work on the tribal conquest, I think, um, and, and looking at that phenomenon um, can be really promising because um, I feel that, uh, and I could be, you know, I could be wrong here, but um, I feel that the emphasis on 
you know, the Quran has a primary document using that to then um, formulate different types of sectarian um, uh, theses alone can be quite problematic. And we've had, you know, in the field of Quranic studies, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, it seems, for, at least from my reading of it, um, that there has been a little bit, uh, you know, the emphasis has been so much on finding the sort of uh, linguistic or philological sort of trajectory is it Syriac and the Quran, you know, the Syriac influence, the Aramaic influence, uh, foreign vocabulary in the Quran, and then, then how can we project that into, um, you know, the religious philology or literatures that existed in that period, and then are these religious communities, you know, that's the, the next step. So I feel that, that, you know, that that approach in and of itself can be somewhat limiting, but if you compare that with the larger sort of phenomenons that we see um, in terms of you know the, the conquest uh, the conquest movement and so on, that can be a little bit more promising methodologically. Um, I don't know if you um, would agree with that or not. Or, um. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question entirely. I mean, you talk about what what Willie yeah. Salaf calls the philological fallacy, the idea of tracing um, Quranic words back to Syriac or Hebrew or something like that. Well, I mean, the thing is though that with all due respect to uh, his argument, the fact is that, I mean, Arabic is a Semitic language, as we would say, it's a, in the Near East. All languages are in contact with other languages. Certainly Arabic was in contact with many other languages. It all, there are also cognate words in these other languages that you can't say it's a descendant of it, but it's, it's a parallel development from an earlier linguistic stock on both mm -hmm. sides. Um, and then you have the question of, uh, particularly with Syriac, okay, so you have speakers of Arabic in Western Arabia, let us say, who are grappling to express religious ideas. In Syriac, nearby, <laughs> in Syria, in southern Jordan, and so on, there's a very well-developed terminology among the Christians and Jews who speak those Aramaic dialects. Right. Um, for religious concepts and for people speaking Arabic to simply borrow those terms for those concepts as they borrow the concepts or as they come up with a concept and say, oh, here's a word for it, is sort of commonplace. It's what languages do. I mean, if, if one is, if one reads um, law in English, you go to law school today, you're going to find a lot of terms that are in Latin. Why? Because when English jurists began articulating their sense of common law and then their sense of more refined law, they drew on the Roman legal tradition. They didn't have to reinvent all these categories and even the special terms for them. So they just borrowed them into their vocabulary. Uh, I think that it's not surprising that we might find parallels of that kind. You know, the prophet or whoever, you know, wrestling with these religious ideas, there was, there was a terminology already prepackaged, you might say, ready to use off the shelf. And so I think in many cases they were used. That doesn't mean that, that there isn't any originality because often they take these terms, they use these concepts in new ways. Um, sometimes even the inversion of the way they're used in the original, but nonetheless, that there's some kind of, some kind of conduit for uh, right. patient there, it seems like it's just a normal, the way societies function, you know? Yeah. And, but it could be a little bit difficult in the sense that um, because we don't have um, a longer written history before the Quran in Arabic, as in the Quran marks like kind of the first major Arabic text, um, that it's difficult. Um, is, is, um, do we see that relationship from Syriac into Arabic maybe lopsided because Syriac has a written history, has longer written history? Um, yeah. It's also important to remember that there, there are other uh, influence. There are a lot of basic terms in the Quran, religious terms that don't um, resonate well with what's in the Syriac Christian <clears throat> writings. Uh, this is something that uh, you know your colleague, my former student Suleiman Dost, has written about, showing yeah. that there are there are certain Quranic concepts that seem to have a closer affiliation with like Ethiopic and South Arabian. Yeah texts uh, so yeah syriac has been more uh more visible to western scholars because more scholars know syriac than know ethiopic or south arabian right, right, uh, right. So, and it's also the case that even though uh, a lot of terminology may be used from 
let us say another tradition, let us say Syriac or some other Christian tradition in general, uh, that doesn't mean either that the ideas are uh, dependent on that earlier tradition or that they're simply replicating it. They may be refuting it. Uh, they may be using those terms to express religious ideas that are completely different. Right. There's a very interesting book, a uh, recent book by an Australian scholar named Mark Dury mm -hmm. um, about the Quran. He calls it the Quran, the Quran and his biblical, uh, some, I've forgotten the word, references. Anyway, uh, his point is that the Quran might be seen as something like um, what we call a Creole, he makes the parallel with Creoles in language. A Creole uh, is where you get um, a certain spoken language as a substratum of a, of a, a language spoken by a culture, and that culture is in conquered, uh, uh, subdued or conquered, and is then dominated for many years by another culture that is obviously militarily superior and able to impose itself and imposes its own language as kind of an official language. Mm -hmm. What happens then is that Mm -hmm. um, the population continues to speak their own language, but they, they take on more and more of the vocabulary from the privileged dominant language, but the structure remains that of the original Creole. So in the case of Haitian Creole, the substructure of the language is still some, from some African language that was the original language of the slaves of, of, of Haiti. Um, but um, something like 90% of the vocabulary is French vocabulary, but the structure and the syntax is all from this African language. So it's, it's not simply French. It's, it's something much more complicated. Than, and so he makes, Dury makes the case that this is, the Quran maybe uh, has something like this, that our focus as scholars on all of these parallels with say Syriac and Christian terminology and so on, may have blinded us to the fact that the Quran may be using these things for very different purposes. Yeah. The terminology may be taken over, but the theological concepts may be totally different. They may be something that came from Arabia or yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. 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 That's absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a larger theme also you find in a lot of the early, um, you know, Near Eastern languages that you'll find, you know, over, you know, dominance of foreign, um, uh, uh, vocabulary, but the grammar, the structure of the grammar is, 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 uh, is distinguished. Um, so I, I'd like to um, maybe uh, wrap up uh, with, a, with a final question, uh, bringing uh, our discussion um, from uh, the late antique period to uh, contemporary period. Um, and uh, looking at contemporary uh, sectarian tensions in the Middle East or religious diversity and pluralism, um, or even, you know, other issues such as, uh, you know, Islamophobia or xenophobia in, in U.S. and Europe. Uh, what do you think um, that the general public here or policymakers in the United States um, and in general could learn from uh, diversity and pluralism as well as sectarian and religious identity from the late antique conquest, uh, context, I should say? Um, you know, thinking about um, you know, what if you were to think of maybe lessons or com in a comparative context, um, what could we maybe learn from, from that period? What did they maybe do better than us? What did they do worse than us? Um, and uh, how can we think of the, of the past as a reference for today, if that's, uh, or if you find that even a, a worthwhile sort of question or comparison? Well, yeah, I mean, I think history goes in waves. Uh, you have you have good times and bad times, and uh, you can have bad times for a lot of different reasons. Um, but you know, one of the things that's so disturbing today is the way people seem to be so willing to weaponize ideologies against each other and demonize somebody who has somewhat different or maybe uh, radically different ideas than you do as sort of make them less than human and therefore some, somebody you should kill. Um, we disagree, if humans are gonna disagree always uh, on things. Um, and if we all agreed on everything, life would be very boring. So we really don't wanna go there. Uh, when we look at the late antique period, it seems like this was a period when on the one hand, there was um, a lot of religious ferment uh, 
but there was also a certain amount of religious toleration at times. It was all, there were also, I, I guess we could say pogroms. You know, I know the Byzantine Orthodox uh, doctrine was sometimes, uh, you know, enforced and people who had monophysite or other beliefs, you know, there were these church councils and they were de decreed to be heretics and so on. But nonetheless, in practical living, these communities lived next to each other, uh, Orthodox, uh, monophysite, monophysite uh, church of the East, you know, and they kind of, people kind of got along. The churchmen might have, you know, um, accused each other of heresy, but people could still get along. And, you know, this also has been the case in many other cultures, you know, Christians, uh, Catholics and Protestants have sometimes fought each other bitterly. And sometimes they've been able to live together and get along. You know, it's a question of uh, sort of accepting the idea that diversity is a normal part of life. Uh, I'm not sure that you know, there's a lot of talk always, uh, if you do medieval Islamic history, people talking about the great experience of uh, medieval Andalus, uh, the great period of convivencia, living together. And so well, this is, it's true, but it's a kind of myth. Uh, it's, uh, as one scholar put it, we don't want to see it as a kind of interfaith utopia. We have not reached an interfaith utopia yet. But there certainly are periods in history when these things are less, you know, intercommunal tensions are less aggravated and periods when they're more aggravated. And uh, I think often the aggravation comes for other reasons. It often comes for economic reasons and so on. And you, um, you know, if there's enough to go around, well, you can live and let live. And when your struggle is, you know, scrapping for resources to survive, then, uh, you know, you tend to stick with your own and try to keep the other side out. So, um, uh, yeah. I don't think that the late antique period has any any great secrets to offer us. Um, even in the 20th century into the 21st, we've seen periods of much greater sort of ecumenicism and openness and 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 uh, diversity being welcomed, and other periods when it was, you know, when it, we were horrible in recent times. Uh, sometimes about in, in being intolerant to our neighbors who are different. So. Um, and so uh, looking now at um, sort of the legacy of, uh, of the work on Muhammad and the Believers, um, they, you know, there definitely does seem to be in the field overall um, much more of a, uh, or a lot of the more recent scholarship is sort of uh, reaffirming or being able to find similar sorts of conclusions that you did in your own work. Um, in the sense that they're triangulating um, in, in um, finding different sort of, you know, uh, methodologies or evidence that seems to um, hint at that um, larger thesis that you had, which uh, was uh, basically, you know, a confessional ambiguity to a certain extent. Um, and so, um, you know, there does seem to be a, a, a good movement on that. And I think um, even though, you know, there, of course, there are always scholarly debates that, that come in um, to this issue, especially something so contentious as, as early Islam. Um, but the next, uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, do you have any other projects uh, on the horizon? Um, what are you um, interested in starting next? And well, let me let me um, let me just uh, may, maybe conclude by just sort of uh, emphasizing. I mean, the the fact is, so much of our difficulty of understanding early Islam uh, resides in the fact that we don't have sufficient documentary evidence from the seventh century. The seventh century is like a you know. It's a very obscure period. We have very few contemporary documentary sources. Um, and this is one of the reasons why for the past 10 years or so, I have been trying gradually to become more familiar with the field of papyrology, to look at the Arabic papyri and other papyri uh, from that period. So we can actually look at actual documentation from the period, not something that was written 100 or 200 years later, this sort of retrospective and trying to give an idealizing picture or a critical picture, but actual documents from the time were that are the equivalent of speech acts in the sense that they're actually doing something. It's a transfer of property. Uh, it's unmediated by any other um, transmitter. We have the original document before us. And you know, Arabic papyrology is something that's now beginning to get to, to develop as a field, but it was one of these things that for 
decades was simply neglected. There was maybe one or two people in the world who did it. Now there are, oh, maybe a hundred who do it, which is a big improvement. And we're starting to get some debate and discussion and more documents actually being published. Mm -hmm. So I've also turned my attention to doing some of that because I think mm -hmm. this is where ultimately some of these questions will be resolved. We'll have to see what the actual documentation says about what was going on. Uh, that I think is important and you know, people who want to do that, go for it. I yeah. It's a very difficult, I, the, the Arabic papyrology class that you offered that, that I took was, um, it, it is really like reading, a, it takes a long time to really look at the text and have it sink in. So it's so, um, it's yeah. so, it's yeah. so much painstaking work and it takes a lot of experience. But uh, I don't think there's any other way. You know, we really need to bring, you know, these documents online. So if we can prepare editions of them and publish them so that not every scholar has to work with the originals that are so hard to work with, but can actually see, okay, a nice printed uh, edition of this text that's reliable and say, oh, well, now that's, that's got a tiny tidbit of information that's actually relevant to something I'm working on. Then we can start to bring this into the discussion and that will, I think, strengthen our understanding of this period, which otherwise is very hard to uh, get a get a grip on. Yeah, inshallah. Um, last words, I know I, I, I said I would pass the last question, but um, do you have any advice for uh, students uh, looking to enter this field of late antique, early Islam? Um, uh, would you have any general sort of advice for the sort of things that they should um, keep in mind as they, as they enter the field? And, um, well, it's helpful to be good with language. If you, if you have a knack for learning language and you like to learn language, then take as much Arabic as you possibly can, but also do some Greek, do some Syriac, do some Coptic, do some South Arabian, do some Ethiopic, do some Middle Persian, do whatever other language, you know, you get one or another, or another of them in addition to the Arabic. I think this is what's going to open up new vistas for us onto how the Middle East or the Near East evolved in this crucial period between say 600 and 800. Well, thank you so much, Professor Donner, uh, for your time. Uh, I think it was a really uh, interesting and fruitful conversation. Um, we look forward to uh, hopefully um, maybe having follow-up interviews in the future. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.